you know, but uh, but last winter I tried to become a Catholic and it didn't work for me. I, I studied and I tried and I gave it everything, but you know, Catholicism for me was die now, pay later, you know, and I just couldn't get with it and I, and I wanted to. You You're know, afraid I, of dying? Well, yeah, naturally, aren't you? I, let me ask you, in reincarnation, does that mean my soul would pass to another human being or would I come back as a moose or an oddvark or something? Take our literature, uh -huh. read it over and think about it. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, Krishna. Who are you kidding? You're gonna be a Krishna? You're gonna shave your head and put on robes and dance around at airports? You look like Jerry Lewis. God, I'm so depressed. Today I would like to speak about dress code. How should a devotee of Krishna dress? Dress code in Chaitanya Vaishnavism, generally speaking, and in particular, dress code in the context of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. I will do this by going to two different directions. First, I plan to uh, unpack and uh, quickly analyze and, and redefine, if you may, or offer an alternative definition to the term uh, devotional dress, a term that is often floating around uh, within bhakti yoga circles uh, around the world. After having touched upon this point, I would like to go to Srila Prabhupada's statements and look at what Srila Prabhupada, the founder of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, has to say about dress code uh, in the light, in the light of what the Srimad Bhagavatam principally and the Chaitanya literatures, which are, we could say, the, the ultimate authority, the ultimate scriptural authority for Chaitanya Vaishnavism, have to say themselves about dress, about dress code, about what a devotee of Krishna should or should not uh, wear. And we'll look at a few examples of, uh, of, of devotees, of famous devotees, in relationship to dress. And finally, we'll address briefly, if time permits, uh, the, the relevance of this discussion. So, to begin, the notion of devotional clothes, um, that term devotional clothes, for those who may be interested, um, it's, it's important to note that, at least within the context of ISKCON, uh, that term devotional clothes, which is often pitted with the term uh, karmi clothes or, or karmi dress, is a term that Srila Prabhupada never coined and never used. Um, if you do a search on the Folio database uh, search engine and type in the word devotional dress, you will find the word come up six times, and each time it's spoken by a disciple of Srila Prabhupada, not by Prabhupada himself. And in terms of the term uh, devotion, um, excuse me, a karmi dress or karmi clothes, that term shows up about 47 times, 45 of which times. Uh, Prabhupada never mentions, again, it's disciples of his who, spent, who, who mentioned that word. And the two times when he does mention that term, um, he's literally quoting a disciple in one of his letters. So therefore, that term, devotional dress or karmi dress or karmi clothes, is, uh, is, is, uh, is a term at least that Srila Prabhupada never himself coined or used. However, it is used today in the context of Iskan and other, other Gaudiya groups, and it's commonly understood that devotional dress, quote-unquote, refers to saris for women, uh, dhotis and kurtas for men. Now, I would like here to make a distinction between uh, uniform on the one hand, dress on the one hand, and on the other hand, um, religious symbols or religious markings. One thing is dress or dress code uniform, what type of clothes one puts on one's body. Uh, another is a, a specific religious marking, a specific uh, uh, symbol of the faith, if you will, such as Tulsi beads or Gaudiya Vaishnav tilak. Uh, in the case of Gaudiya Vaishnavism, these are the exclusive markings of a Gaudiya Vaishnava. Uh, so you have this on the one hand, symbolic markings, and on the other, as I said, you have uh, clothes. And, um, it's important to define the term uniform. A uniform, by definition, is a type of dress that no one else in society wears. Right? A Catholic priest's black dress with a little white collar is precisely like 
dress because no one else in society wears it. Now, the problem, if you will, um, with the idea that dhotis, saris, and kurtas are a devotional dress or a devotional uniform is that the Vaishnavas who wear uh, dhotis and saris and kurtas are, are by far a very small minority of people who wear these clothes compared to, to people who are not Vaishnavas and who do wear these clothes. Um, if you go to India today or centuries ago, People from all types of religious uh, persuasion, uh, different social orders, you name it, Muslims, Buddhists, Christians, wear these type of clothes. Uh, the kurta is, 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 is a wonderful import from the Middle East through the Afghan, uh, Afghan contribution. <laughs> and uh, if you go to, to, for example, the Dubai airport and you go to the prayer room today, you'll see a stream of pious Muslim people coming to offer their prayers to Allah, wearing a kurta that resembles very much the type of kurta that um, Iskand, many devotees uh, in Iskand and in other Chaitanya Vaishnav circles wear. So this kurta as being uh, a uniform of the Vaishnavas and Dodi and the Sari, unfortunately it is difficult to define using this terminology. Now, a few words about um, a, theological, a theological misconception that I think is, is quite prevalent in the world of bhakti yoga today regarding dress and regarding devotional dress, is the idea that because Lord Krishna and his eternal associates uh, wear, wear, or may wear, let's say wear, uh, dhotis and saris in the spiritual world, in, in the kingdom of God, in Goloka Vrindavan, therefore, automatically, in the material world, ordinary dhotis and saris are intrinsically, ontologically imbued with a certain piety or a certain sacrality, and therefore we can call them a devotional dress. Um, the, 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 the implications of this are actually ludicrous when you actually think about it, because if we take that position, namely that wearing dhotis and saris are beneficial because they're worn in the spiritual world, a, you can apply the same logic to everything else. Uh, they have sticks in the spiritual world, uh, butter pots, ankle bells, huts, flower garlands, ch chariots. And so by the same token, you say, well, you know, if we use chariots and, and water, you know, butter pots and sticks and ropes in the material world somehow, I mean, janmadhyayas, janmadhyayasyataha, ultimately everything comes from the spiritual world. So why only focus on dress? And uh, secondly, more importantly, um, the, the, the ethical implications of this are, are, are actually quite strange because they would mean that, for example, um, prostitutes in Bangladesh or in India uh, are slightly more pious or their karmic reactions are slightly, let's say, diminished um, because they, be ha they, are ha they happen to be wearing quote-unquote devotional dress while they perform their, their activities. Uh, whereas prostitutes, let's say, in Amsterdam or New York are unfortunately going to get more karmic reaction for the same act. Um, butchers uh, in India who wear a dhoti while killing buffaloes or, or cows are fortunately wearing devotional dress and therefore they're going to get less karmic reaction than say someone who works in a slaughterhouse in, 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 in Los Angeles. Um, and to use extreme examples and which echo is actually kind of the title of this talk, um, Jaga and Madai may be getting a slightly less a big reaction because they, be, they, are, they happen to be wearing devotional clothes while raping young innocent women, whereas the, the rapists of today in the West who don't wear devotional clothes as we define them here uh, are unfortunately going to get more uh, karmic reactions. This is, this is obviously a, a ludicrous conclusion. After all, the, the Bhagavatam, the second canto, makes this emphatic statement. Krishna actually makes this statement. O Brahma, whatever appears to be of any value, if it is without relation to me, has no reality. Know it as my illusory energy, that reflection which appears to be in darkness. And Lord Chaitanya echoes these terms by saying, quote, anything not conceived in relationship to Krishna should be understood to be illusion. On the other hand, things that are related to Krishna are Krishnais, so to speak, are spiritual. They're not material, or they're not karmi, or non-devotional. Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati Thakur said, quote, the, thing that are used, the things that are used in relation to Lord Krishna are objects belonging directly to the transcendental realm. So therefore, 
I propose a definition of devotional clothes based on utility. In other words, dress, clothes are a neutral item, and depending on how one uses them, those clothes become either devotional or not. So for example, if one is wearing Western clothes, Western modest, chaste, clean clothes to preach Krishna consciousness, to speak about Krishna, to honor Krishna Prashadam, to offer one's food to, to one's deities, and so on and so on, all types of, of devotional activities, those clothes, uh, by definition, must be devotional because one is using them in Krishna's service. So those are the few words on, on the idea of devotional clothes. Now, let us go to uh, Shastra, the Vaishnava Shastras, namely the Bhagavatam, principally. What does the Bhagavatam say and not say about clothes, about how a human being, a bhakti yogi or a bhakti yogini, must dress in order to practice bhakti yoga? My research uh, pushes me to conclude that there's basically two types of quotes or two types of verses or statements in the Bhagavatam and in the Chaitanya literatures as well. One is a type of statements which give positive normative instructions, do this, don't do that, as to how one should dress. Now, what are those instructions and to who do they pertain is the main question. They pertain primarily, if not exclusively, to males, and two, to males in regards to ashram. In other words, in regards to their social situation, um, and specifically in regards to uh, social situations which have to do with renunciation, namely brahmacharya, vanaprastha, and sannyas. You have statements describing how these type of men should dress should wear, what kind of clothes they should wear. However, you do not see statements in the Bhagavatam as to how householders, non-monastic members of the Vaishnava community should dress. There's on the contrary, an inconspicuousness and a sort of a laissez-faire. And rather, and now we're coming to the second type of quotes that we find in, in, in Shastra, there's rather an almost an encouragement to those who are not monastic to remain in their situation, dressed how they usually dress, and practice Krishna consciousness or bhakti yoga. So these are the two types of, of, of verses and passages that I've found in the Bhagavatam. And the question, the interesting question is, is when we look at Srila Prabhupada's statements on dress and his desires and his you know, directives, do they or do they not um, match up with this sort of thematic paradigm that we find in the Bhagavatam? So here are a few examples from the Bhagavatam. They come from the seventh canto in the chapter entitled The Perfect Society for Spiritual Classes. There's a very strong definition or injunction as to how brahmacharis should dress. And here's the translation. Carrying pure kusha grass in his hand, the brahmachari should dress regularly with a belt of straw and with deer skin, deer skin garments. He should wear matted hair carry a rod and water pot and be decorated with a sacred thread as recommended in the Shastra. We should remember that today's ISKCON uniform for brahmacharis and sannyasis, which Srila Prabhupada adopted from Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur, who himself adopted it from the uniform of the Ramakrishna mission of his time, is clearly not mentioned in this description from the Srimad Bhagavatam on how a brahmachari should dress. The Srimad Bhagavatam stresses matted hair, for example, whereas Srila Prabhupada stressed the shaved head and shika for brahmacharis. This shows that there is a principle at play, namely that there should be a uniform of some type for male celibate students. However, the style of that uniform is a detail that changes over historical time. This is how the Vanaprastha should dress in the Bhagavatam. Quote, the Vanaprasa should wear matted locks of hair on his head and let his body hair, nails, and mustache grow. He should not cleanse his body of dirt. He should keep a water pot, deer skin, and rod, wear the bark of a tree as a covering, and use garments colored like fire. Interestingly, there's no specific mention in the seventh canto or anywhere else, if I'm not mistaken, of how sannyasis should dress. 
However, there is this recurring theme throughout the Bhagavatam that when a bhakti yogi renounces the world for spiritual realization, for full absorption in spiritual uh, practice, he or she also basically sheds his or her clothes. In other words, simplifies his dressing to the minimum. Um, the example that comes to mind is Parikshit Maharaj, right? He, he sheds his royal kshatriya dress. He doesn't shed his Vaishnava dress. I claim that there is no such thing as a Vaishnava dress. What he does is he sheds his normal, glory, I mean glorious in the sense of opulent kshatriya dress, gives that up, and then just puts on the bare minimum, namely a loincloth, waiting patiently until he leaves his body, hearing from Shukadev Goswami. And Shukadev Goswami, interestingly enough, uh, is, according to the Bhagavatam itself, completely transcendental to the Varnashram institution, and therefore is completely naked. <laughs> so there's this stream of you know, renunciation leading, in terms of clothes, to an extremely simple, and ultimately to a naked state, right? Um, so this is what we have in terms of positive injunctions. And there's nothing mentioned about householders. And as we'll see from the examples that come in, in both Krishna Leela and in Chaitanya Leela, uh, householders basically always dressed like everybody else dressed in society. And this, of course, has huge implications as to how do we translate this principle in 2015 in the Western world. So now the t second type of, 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 of instructions. Um, my favorite one is from the 10th canto of the Bhagavatam. I think it is, it's the cardinal verse that uh, really needs to be unpacked and, and, and meditated upon. And it is the famous Gyane Prayasamudupasya Namanta Eva verse that Lord Brahma spoke to Lord Krishna and that, uh, excuse me, that Ramananda Roy quoted to Lord Chaitanya in their famous discussion. Uh, the translation of Srila Prabhupada is as follows, quote, those who, even while remaining situated in their established social positions, throw away the process of speculative knowledge and with their body, words, and mind, offer all respects to descriptions of your personality and activities, dedicating their lives to these narrations, which are vibrated by, your, by you personally and by your pure devotees, certainly conquer your lordship, although you are otherwise unconquerable by anyone within the three worlds. Now, what's very interesting in this verse is two words, namely, stane stitaha, or uh, even while remaining situated in their established social positions. So, here's an injunction towards people who are not monks and who are in their established social position, Brahman, Kshatriya, Vaishya, you name it. And when they, if, if and when they want to conquer Krishna, to become Krishna bhaktas, to, to become devotees of Krishna, the injunction there is to remain in their social situation, not changing anything, and simply take to the submissive oral reception process of hearing Krishna's glories and chanting Krishna's glories. So what's interesting here is that, uh, what does it mean, sartorially speaking, to remain in one's social situation? Remaining in one's social situation all, obviously includes culture. And in culture, clothes are a vital element of culture. So Lord Brahma is here saying, remaining in your social situation, you chant Hare Krishna, basically. Translate that into clothes, don't change the way you dress, chant Hare Krishna. That's the injunction that we get in the second type of, of instructions. Dress is not important, dress is non-essential, hearing and chanting and worshiping Krishna is the most important thing. And we see examples of this principle throughout the Vaishnava literatures. And here are a few examples. Uh, in Krishna Leela, in Krishna Leela, um, we see that all the Vaishnavas in Krishna Leela don't dress, or at least it's not mentioned anywhere, that they dress differently from the rest of society, especially the non-monastic ones, right? The monastic ones may have a uniform, but again, it's not a Vaishnava uniform, it's a standard uniform of that particular ashram. For example, Durva Samuni, probably dressed the same way as, as Sandipani Muni, give or take a few things. They were dressed as Munis. One is an eternal liberated, eternal associate of, of Lord Krishna, and uh, the other is, is an envious, uh, you know, non-devotee. Um, the Brahmins, look at Sudama Brahmana, for example. There is no mention that Sudama Brahmana dressed differently than the non-Vaishnava Brahmins of his time. 
Um, similarly, there's no mention anywhere in the Mahabharata or Bhagavatam that I'm aware of that the Pandavas uh, dress differently from the Kauravas, for example. Neither their wives. Did Draupadi or Kunti dress any way differently from the non-Vaishnava Kshatriya queens of their time? Now, fast forward to Lord Chaitanya's time, 500 years ago, West Bengal. Um, again, looking at different Varnas, you see the same principle. Among the Brahmins, for example, you have um, Sarvabhamavatacharya, Srivas Thakur, Advaita Acharya. Uh, of course, one converts, quote unquote, to Krishna Bhakti, that's Sarvabhamavatacharya, but there's no mention that he changed the way he dressed. And similarly, there's no mention that neither Srivas Thakur or Advaita Acharya dressed in any way differently from the rest of society. The best example is Lord Chaitanya himself, pre and post sannyas, and especially pre and post converting, quote unquote, to Krishna consciousness. Uh, followers of the Chaitanya tradition will claim that Lord Chaitanya is God himself, so he's obviously <laughs> the, 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 the ideal or the ultimate personification of, of Krishna Bhakti, but he's playing a lila, a pastime, and so he plays the role of a non-devotee at first, and there's one fine day where he finally kind of tips over and becomes a devotee after his trip to, to, to Gaya and his return to Navadvip. And when he returns to Navadvip, the Chaitanya Bhagavad describes in, in detail that all of a sudden he becomes a, a fervent Krishna Bhakta. All the devotees of Krishna are delighted by this change of events. No mention that Lord Chaitanya dresses any differently than he did before he became a devotee. He does dress differently when, however, when he changes ashrams, when he goes into a renounced type of ashram, when he takes to the sannyas order. Then he changes into, a, 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 as he dresses as a sannyasi. And mind you, an Advaita Vedanta is sannyasi. So he probably wore the dress. Basically, in other words, it's, it's, it's not a Vaishnava dress again that he changes into. It's a Varnashram, and specifically an ashram dress that he puts on. It's very, very significant. Uh, coming down to the Kshatriyas, King Prataparudra. Uh, it's interesting, the Chaitanya Charitamrita does mention how when he wanted to have a darshan of, of, of Lord Chaitanya, he put on, the Bengali says, a Vaishnava Vesh. But the point is, he's already a Vaishnava, and everyone knows that. He's, a, he's the greatest, one of the greatest Jagannath Bhaktas in Jagannath Puri. So it's, it, it must be the case that when he puts on the Vaishnava dress, or Vaishnava Vesh, to use the Bengali, he is again, kind of doing the same thing that Parikshit Maharaj does. He simplifies his dress. He simplifies his dress, kind of a sadhu dress, so that he can gain entrance into Lord Chaitanya's world, which is surrounded by, by renounced uh, sannyasis for the most part. So um, that, is, that is an interesting, uh, an interesting point there. Um, we also see the same principle in the story of Sanatan Goswami and his expensive blanket that he uh, traded in for a used, cheap, patched quilt. The principle at play here was not changing into a Vaishnava dress per se, but changing into a dress that was appropriate for the renunciate context of that time, a changing into the typical sadhu dress, typified by the principle of renunciation and simplicity. Um. Kulavichar Sridhar, to go to the, Vaishnava, uh, to the Vaishyas, Kulavichar Sridhar is a Vaishya, externally speaking, no mention of his uh, wear, uh, wearing a different type of clothes than the non-Vaishnava banana leaf vendors uh, in Navadvipa at that time. And finally, uh, Haridas Thakur, quote-unquote lowest uh, in the social rank, um, it's described that he wore a beard, a typically Muslim beard. So here's the Namacharya, of the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition, and he has a beard like a, like a, like a, like a Muslim non-Vaishnava. So here we see again and again that um, these two types of instructions are visible in the lives of the Vaishnavas. There doesn't seem to be a normative um, cross-Varna uniform that defines all the Vaishnavas as a community and distinguishes them in terms of clothes, not in terms of markings, from the rest of the society. Like, for example, the Sikh community uh, after the Khalsa is established in 1699, or the Amish or the Mennonite community, or the Hasidic and or uh, Orthodox Jewish community. That is not the case in the Vaishnav history. Rather, we see that uh, there is no uniform. If there is a uniform, it's meant for monastic type of, of men, and the rest of society, which obviously comprises the largest percentage of society, 
is free to, to, to follow strictly the principles of bhakti, dressing nonetheless as everyone dresses in the rest of society. Before going on to Srila Prabhupada's statements, we can recall in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, Lord Chaitanya's instructions to Raghunath Das Goswami before Raghunath Das Goswami becomes a renunciate and goes to Jagannath Puri. While still living at home, he receives the following instructions from Lord Chaitanya. From the Madhya Leela chapter 16, Lord Chaitanya tells him, Don't be a crazy fellow. You should not make yourself a show bottle devotee and become a false renunciant. For the time being, enjoy the material world in a befitting way and do not become attached to it. Within your heart, you should keep yourself very faithful, but externally, you may behave like an ordinary man. Before going on to Srila Prabhupada's statements, uh, it is interesting to note one more passage from, from scripture, and that is the case of Pundarik Vidyanidhi, uh, as described in Chaitanya Bhagavat. <sighs> Gadadhar Pandit had a doubt about uh, the, the possible spirituality of Pundarik Vidyanidhi, who externally was A, dressed like everyone else in society, but not only that, was dressed very opulently, that Bhagavat describes. Um, and yet, when Mukunda started reading the famous passage from the 10th canto where uh, Krishna is glorified as being merciful because he gave the same position to Putana who tried to kill him as he did to Mother Yashoda, uh, Pundarik Vidyanini erupts in, 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 in complete rapture, ripping off his clothes, breaking his expensive furniture in ecstasy, in ecstasy of, of, of Krishna Prema. And Gadara Pandit, witnessing this, realizes that he's committed an offense to him and thus uh, takes shelter of him as his, as his spiritual master. Um, aside from the esoteric position of who they are in Krishna Lila, the, the lesson to be learned is that even highly advanced Vaishnavas can commit the mistake of judging other Vaishnavas based on external, uh, external dress, uh, external considerations. So that uh, instruction is quite important. Now, having established this sort of framework, Shastric and theological, um, and historical I mean, let us look at what Srila Prabhupada says. Um, at first, there seems to be a contradiction. When you look at what every, everything that Prabhupada said, there seems to be quotes where he says, yeah, yeah, dress, well, he doesn't say yeah, yeah, excuse me, but he says dress is very important, the robes are very important. And there's all sorts of other quotes which, in which he says dress is not important, you don't have to, and so on. Some devotees have interpreted or tried to harmonize this apparent contradiction by using what is called um, the uh, Parukshavad argument. And the Parukshavad argument is that you, you say something, but you really don't mean it. In other words, you're just being diplomatic, it's a strategy, but you don't really mean what you say. So, for example, uh, Prabhupada many times said that in his conviction, the soul does fall from the spiritual world. Some Vaishnavas say, well, Prabhupada really said that, but he didn't really mean it. He was just being diplomatic or strategic to appeal to a Western audience who's used to a biblical type of, 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 of theology, and, but actually he meant something else. And similarly, uh, when Prabhupada you know, said to many people that, oh, dress is not important and so on, he really didn't mean it. He was just trying to encourage them to bring him to a higher level of commitment. And therefore, and you see that his real opinion in the statements where he does stress the importance of, 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 the, of the traditional Indian dress. I say that's a very dangerous position to hold. That's a very slippery type of, of road to take because if you apply that type of hermeneutics to, to, to one thing that Srila Prabhupada says, uh, whether it's the fall of the soul or whether it's the close, then you can apply to anything he says. It's not important. He said chant 16 rounds, but he really didn't mean it. Um, you can really get into, into problems with that. So the way, the way I think is the best way to harmonize these seemingly contradictory statements of Prabhupada is precisely to zoom out and see what the Bhagavatam says and the history of the tradition shows, as we have just done. And very interestingly and very satisfactorily, uh, Prabhupada's statements do concord very much with these two types of valences, which we find in the authoritative scriptures. So here are the two. Now, before we go into these, I would like to speak a little bit about what Prabhupada, Prabhupada's own dressing, to, to speak a little bit about his own example as a dresser, not just what he said. Um, Prabhupada, of course, wore the dress of a sannyasi in his end, the end of his life. However, 
most of his life, he dressed like a typical gentleman, a higher class gentleman of West Bengal. And that dress was most certainly shared by other people in the society who were not Vaishnavas. Now, when we look at Srila Prabhupada after he, or as he establishes ISKCON, after he takes sannyas, he obviously is very much restricted in the way he's going to dress because he's a sannyasi, and therefore sannyasis have a stricture in terms of, of, of dress code, simplicity, and so on, as we've, we've seen. However, in spite of that, Prabhupada was extremely flexible. Prabhupada was extremely flexible and accommodating, and, 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 and he adjusted. For example, uh, when he was in London at George Harrison's estate, uh, the Lila Amrita by Satsuru Maharaj describes one outing, and this is how, he, this is how he was dressed. Prabhupada walked out into the morning mist onto the long, wet grass. Dressed almost entirely in black, he wore a Russian hat with earmuffs and black rubber Wellington boots, a black full-length overcoat given him by the devotees in Germany, covered his robes and sweater, leaving only glimpses of saffron cloth. Now, please look at this picture. This context is Prabhupada coming with his surprisingly astonishing group of, of, of white American Vaishnavas and Vaishnavis to India. And the dress he's wearing here, if you, if you look closely, he's not wearing a kurta under his chadar. What he's wearing is a typical Colorado slash Arizona, especially Texas style of cowboy, button down, six button type of shirt. And that's saffron. The story behind it is that one of his female disciples from probably Texas uh, stitched it up and, and, and made it for him with the idea, with the meditation that Srila Prabhupada is a cowherd boy and therefore cowherd boy equals cowboy and therefore <laughs> the American notion of a cowboy is you know the, the typical cowboy with the boots and the jeans. Yeah, a type of shirt that has a very long collar, especially in the 70s, they were extremely long. So this is what he's wearing. He's wearing in public, day in and day out for seven days straight, an American tailored shirt resembling the, cow, the, you know, the Texan cowboy style with mother, big mother of pearl buttons. He wore it with, with pleasure. Uh, Prabhupada also wore stitched cloth on the altar, but the issue of pancharatrika, uh, in other words, deity worship, is a, is a whole other sort of Pandora's box that uh, I don't have time to unpack uh, here with. Needless to say, Prabhupada was very flexible. He himself said in 1969 in a letter, I am a sannyasi, but if some important work requires I dress myself just like a smart gentleman, I would immediately accept it. So it is not a problem. So now let's look at Srila Prabhupada's statements. Um, as we do so, it is very important to remember an important, very important demographic detail. And it is this. In the 1970s, during Srila Prabhupada's presence on earth, um, ISKCON literally was a big international brahmachari ashram. In other words, membership in ISKCON consisted almost exclusively of giving up one's family or giving up one's social relations, moving into a temple as a brahmachari, financially fully dependent, excuse me, upon the institution. There were a few householders, but they were living very renounced lives, basically like a brahmachari, fully dependent financially on the institution. There was no such thing as a congregation member, there was certainly no such thing as an initiated congregation member. What to speak of an initiated congregation member who has decades more depth and experience of Krishna consciousness than a brahmachari in a temple. That simply did not exist. What you had under Prabhupada's, in Prabhupada's presence was just an army of young men and women who for 99% of the cases were monastic, uh, the monastic type. So I say this because when Prabhupada often refers to things like my students or the students in the International Society for Krishna Consciousness or the members of the Hare Krishna movement, we must remember that he's referring to what he had at that time, namely brahmacharis and brahmacharinis and sannyasis. This is very important to remember. This is why, for example, if we go back to Woody Allen's clip, which was filmed in the early 80s, when ISKCON was still a monastic institution, he tells a devotee in Central Park, while asking him philosophical questions, I don't want to join or anything. There was a sense then that if you converted to Bhakti Yoga or Chaitanya Vaishnavism, you had to join the temple. You became a monk. You wore robes. A uh, question is, how much is this fear in the general public's eye still prevalent today? How much are members of ISKCON reinforcing this idea by their body language? 
Furthermore, as you'll see, when Prabhupada is referring to robes and dhotis and so on, he is loyal to the Bhagavatam, referring to an ashram consideration. So let us begin. Prabhupada says in the Madhya Lila purport, Sometimes members of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, especially in the Western countries, find it difficult to approach people to distribute books because people are unfamiliar with the traditional saffron robes of the devotees. So here he is combining the, the word devotee, which technically applies to women and householders in the majority and a few renounce, renunciates. But here he's saying the traditional saffron robes of the devotees. In an interview in 68, someone says, about the way you're clothed, the way you're dressed today, uh, the robes, Prabhupada answers, oh, the robe? I am a sannyasi. Again, an answer in relationship to Varna, which he again certifies in the following quote. Mr. Koshi asks him, I mean to say something different. I mean about the saffron robe, the shaving of the head with the little Prabhupada interrupts him and says, oh yes, Varnashram. Varan ashram, this is ashram, he is sannyasi, he must take to it. The following interview is uh, very useful because it shows this twofold dynamic in one particular instance. The interview asks, what is the purpose of the robes and having your head shaved? Prabhupada says, just like you dress in a certain way, I dress in a certain way. So we have got this dressing system in our Krishna consciousness movement. And it is taken from Vedic literature. A brahmachari should dress like that. Our dress is saffron. This dress is not a very important thing, but when one is initiated, he accepts the regulations which I give them. So when he's referring here to when one is initiated, just before he mentioned brahmachari, he mentioned the word saffron. He'll mention the word brahmachari again after. So he's not referring to general initiation by householders, He's referring, in my opinion, specifically to those who joined the temple, and that means brahmacharis and sannyasis. He continues, so it is not that if you do not come in that dress in our temple, you will not understand our philosophy. Anyone who does not want to change this dress, that does not matter, we don't insist. These brahmacharis, they voluntarily change. Otherwise, there are many students, just like we have got two or three students, they are working. They come just like ordinary American gentlemen. So there is no objection in that way. Dress is not a very important thing. The next quote, which I love. When I read the first time, I was somewhat blown away. Rameshwar says, 1977, I'm just saying that it is a little difficult if they wear their dhoti. Prabhupada says, no, dhoti, I didn't say. You have nice coat pant. I don't say that you have to. I never said that. You have adopted it. Everyone laughs. I never said that you put on dhoti. But those who are sannyasis, brahmacharis, their dress is different. But it doesn't require that one has to become a sannyasi. Now let's go to the second type of instructions, the instructions that echo the Stanistitaha verse from the 10th canto of the Bhagavatam. This is a conversation in 1974 in Paris, where Jyotir Mai tells Prabhupada, no, no, he's saying, why are we dressing like that, or like Indians? She was French. Prabhupada answers, I have not said that you dress like that. You like, you do it. Did I say that you do it? We are not concerned with the dress. We are concerned with the advancement of spiritual understanding. That's all. In a conversation in 1977, Prabhupada says this. This should be strictly out outlawed. No more sannyasis. And those sannyasis who have fallen, you get them married. No more show bottle cheating. Better go and speak philosophy in your grihasta dress. Not this dress. Rather, you have nice coat, pant, gentlemen. Who says no? I never said. Rather, I shall be glad to see that up-to-date gentlemen with tilak and shika are speaking. That is very prestigious everywhere. Why this false dress? What is the wrong to become a grihasta? In 1971, in Melbourne, someone tells Prabhupada, mm, and what about your dress? Don't you think your dress alienates people? To which Prabhupada answers, oh, dress, that is not very important. We can wear shirt, coat, pants. The dress is not important. The important thing is that you become Krishna conscious. Another quote, echoing this Shrutigatam verse. Therefore, this process, yukta vairagya, it is called yukta vairagya. You just remain in your place. 
This is the facility of the Hare Krishna movement. You haven't got to change your place. You remain. You are a student, you remain a student. You are a businessman, you remain a businessman. You are a woman, man, or anyone, black, white, anyone, you remain. I mean, <laughs> it'd be difficult to change from black to white or white to black, or I guess there was no, there was no trans, transgender operations back then. But uh, <laughs> the point is, simply try to hear stanistita. You just remain in your position, you simply hear. Very simple process. Hmm. Um, the last one here. This is actually my favorite one. This is Sachinandan Swami who tells it. So Sachinandan Swami talks about an, an incident when his father spoke to Prabhupada. And Sachinandan Swami says, My father said to Prabhupada, I cannot believe that it is responsible to bring a foreign culture, that is Indian culture, into Germany. It will not survive. The people who are now with you will not be able to stay. It is almost like taking a crocodile from Egypt and transplanting it in the cold river Rhine. It is irresponsible. Prabhupada took up the challenge. He looked at my father. He said, you can be Krishna conscious in a suit and tie. Unquote. This is an important consideration. It reminds me, actually, once Sachinandan Swami, a few years ago, we were discussing about this issue, and um, there's just an anecdote. He told me, he told me, Chandra mm, Shekhar, mm, we, we, like we are like the tiger in the zoo. Mm, mm, people like to, to see the tiger in the zoo, mm, but they do not want to go on the other side of the fence mm, to touch the, the tiger. Mm, yes, we are, we are like tigers in the zoo, incidentally. Now, a few words about tilak, hair, neck beads. As, as we mentioned, neck beads, tilak are the definitive Gaudiya Vaishnava symbols. Those are really the thing that distinguishes the Gaudiya Vaishnavas from other uh, Hindus and from anyone else in the world for that matter. Uh, shaving head, however, uh, or not shaving one's head, um, if you look at Prabhupada's statements, they again fall into these two types of, of, of categories. One for the renunciants, one for those who are not. Um, for example, Tamil Krishna Maharaj in his memories mentions, uh, one morning I shaved my head for the first time. When Prabhupada came out of his apartment, he looked at me and he said, oh, now you are an ideal brahmachari. Um, on the other hand, you have a few cases, which are rare because, again, in those days, the demographics were such of Iskand that no one was a congregation member. Um, in the initiation that takes place in Detroit in 1976, uh, Hari Sari Prabhu recalls how during an initiation ceremony, uh, several men came up and they were not shaved. This is mentioned in, in his volume two of the diary. And they were not shaved and Prabhupada stopped and he said, and he asked, why are they not shaved? They explained to Hari Sori, who then explained to Prabhupada that they were working. They were working men. They were in the world. In other words, they were non-monastic devotees. And Prabhupada immediately relented and said, oh, that is fine. And he added, quote unquote, he said they should keep it short and respectable. Uh, this reminds me of Ambarish Prabhu. As you can see from this picture, this is Prabhupada's giving initiation to Ambarish Prabhu, who obviously was not a monk at the time. And Ambarish Prabhu has grown out respectable hair, exactly like Prabhupada mentions here. And there doesn't seem to be a problem, only smiles. Um, Ambarish Prabhu told me personally that Prabhupada, during a darshan in Hawaii, told the devotees sitting there, you should all have your hair like Ambarish Prabhu. So we should be careful, or leaders of ISKCON should be careful not to go overboard. If it was okay for Prabhupada to give initiation to householders or to non-monastic members of ISKCON with gentlemanly grown out hair, why should, it be a, why should, should, should we go further than that and, and, and demand a, a, a shave up a ceremony, for example? Now, to, 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 to close this little chapter on Srila Prabhupada's quotes, it is important to make the distinction as he himself made between Srila Prabhupada's personal aesthetic likes, on the one hand, what he liked aesthetically, and on the other hand, universal principles that overrided and still must override his personal tastes. Let me explain. On the one hand, for example, Prabhupada expressed his likes in terms of culinary taste. In 1968, he says, everyone knows that I am very fond of mangoes. Um, the Lilamrita describes how the woman cooking for Prabhupada brought him American desserts like apple pie, donuts, glaze, cookies. Prabhupada would smile, but he would only nibble at his dessert. One afternoon he said, these sweets are very nice, but no one has made me sandesh. So Prabhupada prefers sandesh to donuts. However, he, when it came down to it, he expressed the principle 
And the principle is, whatever you offer me, offer it with devotion, as Krishna states. In a conversation with Allen Ginsberg, Prabhupada replies, oh, India, don't talk of India, talk of philosophy. If there is no devotion, Krishna does not accept anything you offer him. Lord Krishna is not obliged to accept anything costly because it is very tasty. Krishna has very many tasteful dishes in Vaikuntha. He is not hankering after your food. He accepts your devotion, bhakti. That is the real thing, devotion, not the food. So let's go to clothes again, dress. Prabhupada did, in certain instances, express a, pre a preference for clothes. For example, in the Lilamrita, it mentions that Swamiji com commented that he did not like Western women's dress. And therefore, at his request, Yamuna was dressed in a sari. Uh, in a conversation in Paris in 1974, Prabhupada says, these girls, when they dress in Indian way, so you know, don't, 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 don't blame the, the messenger to say that this dress is Indian. Prabhupada himself says it. <laughs> these girls, when they dress in Indian way, they look more beautiful. So that's his, that's his personal liking there. Um, and yet, on the, in the same time, he may change his mind, and that does not alter the, the fundamental principle that devotion is really the, the main factor. In that same conversation, the priest says, well, maybe for ladies and girls, they're more beautiful, but for the dhoti, Prabhupada cuts him off and says, we are not concerned with the dress. We are concerned with the advancement of spiritual understanding. That's all. Prabhupada may have liked dhotis for householders. For example, Goras, uh, in uh, Jadurani, Devi Dasi mentions that Gora Sundar, who had just showed up, came walking by wearing a dhoti and tilak. Previous to that day, he had always been wearing hair and karmi clothes. You see, not mentioned by Prabhupada. Srila Prabhupada was so happy and said, you look like Gora Sundar. So Prabhupada liked that. At the same time, uh, Satsuru Maharaj remembers that when Prabhupada saw a picture of Balavanta Prabhu uh, preaching into a microphone during a political campaign, he had grown out hair, a suit and a tie, tilak, and, and his shika was trimmed and his hair was grown out. When Prabhupada saw that picture, he said, this is what we want. We want to preach in American dress. He said, we should be known as American Krishnas, right? So the taste is there, one's personal likings. Ultimately though, what really counts is what, does the, 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 what is the principle here? And, and this is something that, that is worth um, taking into account. It therefore behooves us to look for the underlying principle just as we see that the underlying principle in food is ultimately devotion to Krishna over and above what type of specific food one may personally like, in a similar fashion, one may say that the principle of cleanliness, of chastity, of modesty is the underlying principle in this sartorial issue. In the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna says, those who are demoniac do not know what is to be done and what is not to be done. Neither cleanliness, nor proper behavior, nor truth is found in them. In the Srimad Bhagavatam 5.6.10, cleanliness is again emphasized. People who are lowest among men will abandon bathing three times daily and worshipping the Lord. Abandoning cleanliness, they will accept nonsensical principles not regularly bathing or washing their mouths regularly, they will always remain unclean. In a conversation in 1976, Srila Prabhupada says, we must be clean. Hari Shori says, you can dress in karmi clothes and still be very strict Vaishnava. Prabhupada says, just like he is not well dressed, but anyone will see him, he'll immediately find he's cleansed. That is wanted. Cleansed dress. Dress is not important. In a letter dated June 20th, 1968, Srila Prabhupada writes to one of his female disciples, It would be nicer if you can put on sari. You must remain like a nice girl. The dress and appearance is social convention of the society. So one may say that here he's stressing the wearing of a sari, but the underlying principle is what he calls the necessity to remain like a nice girl. What is it mean to be like a nice girl, uh, in Prabhupada's own words. It most probably implies modesty, cleanliness, uh, chastity. So, just as there are plenty of examples in the modern world of uh, unchaste, unmodest, unrespectable ways of dressing for both uh, men and women, 
uh, there are similarly, as we have seen, examples of unchaste, unmodest uh, ways of dressing in the Indian style of dress. And just as there are many examples of clean, respectable, and modest ways of dressing in the Indian style, there are also many examples of clean, respectable, chaste, and modest ways of dressing in the Western or modern style, a style which differs clearly from the Indian dress styles. And yet, the underlying principles of chastity, uh, cleanliness, respectability, and modesty are visible, even more so in some cases than in the Indian style. These pictures, for example, are from the clothes that a devotee named Mandali designed, retaining, I would say, the principle of cleanliness, chastity, modesty, and so on. What is the big freaking deal? <laughs> to use a statement that a professor at University of California uh, says. What is the BFD? Well, the BFD, the big freaking deal, is that this issue is extremely, rel extreme rel let me put that again. The BFD is that this issue is extremely important, I think, for the growth of Chaitanya Vaishnavism in the Western world, in the modern world. It is extremely important for the growth of bhakti yoga as a mainstream, powerful um, movement and, and phenomena in today's civilization. When you go on Google today and you type Hare Krishna, the first 10 images you'll see are images of deities or paintings of Radha and Krishna. And then you get about 50 pictures of this. This is the representation of Hare Krishna today. In other words, the question that we have to ask is, what is the body language of the members of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness? And in particular, what message through our body language or through the body language of the, of, of the Chaitanya Vaishnavas in general, what message do the grihastas or the non-monastic members of this community want to uh, put forth to uh, American society today or Western society today? Is it that on the one side, yes, we practice a spiritual science. Yes, our founder, our scriptures say that if you're non-monastic, you do not have to have a uniform. You do not even have to shave your head. But actually, when you become serious about practicing Krishna consciousness, you must adopt a very distinct type of uniform, regardless of your varna or your ashram. If we consider the current socio-political pulse of the West, where there is a general sensitivity, if not hypersensitivity, to fanatic religious dogma and ethnicity as religion, is it wise, one may ask, to associate publicly the science of bhakti yoga with cultural symbols and dress that are invariably associated today with non-Western, often Muslim, Middle Eastern society? Take, for example, the poster for an exhibit in Paris in 2014 at the Institut du Monde Arabe, or the Arab World Institute. The title of the exhibit was, quote-unquote, Mughal India. In other words, Muslim India. And what it did portray? A couple doing Bharat Natyam dance with sari and dhoti. Notice the association, Mughal India. Is it therefore necessarily the best thing, for example, to call our ISKCON festivals Festival of India? Why not Festival of Jagannath or Festival of Krishna? So it is a big important point because I personally believe after having studied the history of religion for, for more than half a decade now, almost a decade, that when you have two groups of people with two different types of religion, the general tendency, historically speaking, is that when the culture of one group and the culture of the second group are similar, then the rate of conversion from people of group one to group B, in other words, people who convert from the religion of their group A to the religion of group B, is higher when there's 
concordance, culturally speaking, between group A and group B. And conversely, when there are large cultural differences between group A and group B, the, the statistics show that the rate of conversion from the people of religion of group A to people of, to the religion of group B is much smaller. I strongly believe this. I strongly believe this. So, so therefore, as a practicing bhakti yogi, as a member of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, I strongly believe that the more hurdles or the more hoops, culturally speaking, that we add on top of the non-negotiable uh, theological and, and, and praxis-oriented principles of Krishna consciousness, such as the 16 rounds if you want to be initiated, such as the strict adherence to the four regulative principles, such as theologically accepting that God is a person and he happens to be named Krishna, and he plays the flute and his girlfriend is Radharani and so on, the ultra-specific theological definition of what the spiritual reality is as described in the Bhagavatam, those are non-negotiables. Um, if we add extra non-necessary and non-findable in Shastra and non-findable in Srila Prabhupada's directives, uh, cultural hoops through which people have to go through to access the non-negotiables non which are already set at a very high standard, but which, uh, sorry, are not negotiable, then it's going to become more difficult for Gaudiya Vaishnavism to spread in the modern world. Uh, finally, uh, we see that water is already seeking its own level. In other words, bhakti yogis, bhakti yoginis in the modern world are already practicing Krishna consciousness a la Francaise or a la American or a la Russian um, in their homes. They're offering food and eating food which is local. They're dressing in local styles um, at public events such as a picnic or a, a kirtan get together at a park and so on. Uh, as you see, devotees generally often dress in regular clothes. Um, Harinam parties are starting to become more and more uh, modernized or westernized. But I think the, the key question to ask is, uh, now that ISKCON is no longer a monastic movement, and as we have seen that really only monks are required to have a uniform, um, the question is, what should be the standard of dress code for a, an official ISKCON or non-ISKCON temple? Um, for important services such as giving a lecture or uh, leading a kirtan or uh, a marriage ceremony or I would say even an initiation ceremony, at least the first initiation. Um, what, sh what should the leaders of, 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 of Vaishnav organizations such as ISKCON stress as, as the standard? Um, I think this is where there's a disconnect. Uh, I think the temples are still kind of stuck in a framework of a monastic uh, 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 paradigm, whereas the, 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 the rest of, of the Vaishnava community has grown uh, independent of temples and are already practicing Krishna consciousness you know, at the, in the Stanistitaha style. And therefore, the question should be, uh, who does a temple of ISKCON uh, or related institutions represent today? Uh, does it represent only monastic members or does it represent uh, non-monastic members as well. After all, um, unlike the Catholic Church, uh, where only celibate male monks are uh, given the, the ecclesiastical power to perform important uh, services, um, in the Vaishnav tradition, I think there's a much more strong resemblance with uh, Protestant Christianity, for example, or even Judaism or, or Islam, for that matter, where there's a sort of a horizontal equality um, whether one is a shudra, whether one is a brahmana, whether one is a celibate or, or a householder, if one knows Krishna, one is a guru. So there's this sort of egalitarian approach where anybody in any context, varna or ashram, has the prerogative, theoretically at least, to uh, take on important roles in Chaitanya Vaishnavism up to the point of, of guru, whether shiksha or, or diksha as well. And so therefore, when we again bring in the issue of dress code, um, since we've basically established that there is no such thing as a, as, a, as a monochromatic uniform that applies to all members of a given Vaishnav community, um, therefore a temple should, I think, be broad enough and, 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 and liberal enough to accommodate 
uh, everyone from all varnas and all ashrams to be able to represent Krishna without having to uh, automatically uh, change into either an Indian style of dress or a style of dress which we have seen is really meant for monastic males. Um, until that happens, uh, I do not believe that uh, bhakti yoga will spread as effectively uh, around the world, especially around the Western world, as uh, it could and as it, it should. Um, I'll leave you with a story that for me illustrates this point. Um, I went to a Sunday feast uh, festival, this weekly open house service at one of our ISKCON temples in Laguna Beach. This was a few years ago. A group of teenagers came and uh, they were curious and they happened to come just before the kirtan began. I befriended some of them, especially one called John, and who immediately was a little bit defensive and told me, look, I'm a Christian, I belong to Orange County uh, Evangelical Church or whatever it's called, and uh, I don't want to convert or anything. And I was like, okay, that's fine. And then he asked me, well, how come, so, what, what's up with the dress, as he mentioned? And pointing to some devotees in the temple room who were starting to, to, to come to, um, to the kirtan. And I mentioned, well, this is a discussion that is actually going on in our church. And there's, uh, there's some people in our church who believe that uh, the traditional Indian dress is, a, is, a, is an essential component to the practice of, of, of bhakti yoga, as we call it. And another group uh, considers it to be uh, very much uh, non-important. And he told me this, and these words will, will always remember, will always stay in my mind, because I think they, they illustrate, just like you can take one piece of rice from a pot of rice, and you can tell the condition of all the, the, the hundreds and thousands of, of, of rice pebble, or rice grains in the pot. Similarly, I think his reaction um, illustrates the, the general state of, uh, of mind of, uh, of modern people today, especially young people. Uh, he said, Wow, if I had to dress like Jesus dressed 2,000 years ago in order to be a member of my church, I would never be a member of my church. That struck me. So I think it behooves uh, practitioners of Gaudiya Vaishnavism to, to um, ask themselves, uh, what am I representing? What do I want to represent? What message do I want to put out uh, to the world um, so that uh, individually and collectively, uh, I can be an efficient, uh, an efficient tool uh, in the hands of Lord Chaitanya, as, 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 practitioners, as practitioners would claim. So thank you very much for your attention. And uh, it was an honor to, to be able to share this with you. I'm sorry I couldn't be here personally in your, in your physical presence, but I hope to, to be able to do so in the, in the soon future. Thank you. <laughs>